Hello everybody, this is Farah Farahati. I'm using Health Economics 6th edition by Santura Noon. I also use a few other peer-reviewed articles and uh, online sources uh, about uh, um, related to the chapter 12, the physician services industry. This is lecture one, the structure of the physician's services industry. As you remember from the previous lectures, we use the structure conduct par uh, performance party to analyze different industries in the healthcare system. So in this lecture, we use the structure conduct performance party to analyze over changing physicians services industry. The American Medical Association was founded in 1847. Uh, throughout the 19th century, the physician services was unregulated. So the American Medical Association asked the Carnegie Foundation to conduct a, a research a study about the quality of the uh, medical school in North America, in the United States and Canada. The Flaxner Report, published in 1910, was very critical about the quality of the medical schools in North America. Uh, North America. So uh, after that report, low quality medical schools were forced to improve or close their doors. And also uh, estates began to take the role of licensing uh, physicians more uh, seriously. Uh, previously, most of the doctors were self-employed male physicians who owned a solo practice and charged uh, the patient based on the fee for services. And today, over the um, one fourth of physicians is um, female, and um, multi-physician practices are the norm, and uh, have to negotiate with the managed care organizations. They have to follow the guidelines uh, and they are subject basically to utilization reviews. As you remember, we use this um, chart to analyzing market. Um, and in this lecture, we use the market structure by looking at the number and distribution of the physicians and barrier to entry. And also we look at the conduct by looking at the pricing behavior, basically the reimbursement method. Um, and also we look at the performance of physicians with respect to the production uh, and efficiency of their work. We also look at the, whether this uh, changing uh, reimbursement method by uh, medical uh, managed care organization uh, affecting the objective and incentives of the physicians to uh, basically maximize their profit or uh, maximize the quality of their work. So as you remember, we use this scaling scale to determine the market power for our industry. So by looking at the characteristics, uh, by number of the physicians and distribution of the physicians and barriers to entry, um, Etc. We look at um, the market power of the physicians and determine whether uh, currently uh, physicians in the United States have market power or not. So basically, the objectives of Chapter 12 um, are uh, looking uh, basically the, uh, analyzing the physicians' uh, industry by looking at the structure. Uh, conduct and performance of the physician services industry. The uh, structure of the physician services industry, uh, we have to basically look at the number of the physicians. Um, so the physician's labor is the primary input in the production of the physician services, right? So therefore, um, we have to look at the number of the physicians. So first, a step, we look at the absolute number of the physicians and we see that uh, it has been increased over the past three decades. Then second, uh, we have to look at the, the ratio of the physicians to population because 
what if the populations, uh, you know, rich, uh, populations uh, increase over the past three decades more than the number of the physicians. So therefore, uh, the physician to population ratio is the usual uh, indicator of the uh, increase or decrease of the number of the uh, physicians in uh, country in the country. So the number of the when we look at the number of the patient care physicians per 100,000 civilian, we can we see that we have increased substantially. Uh, uh, basically during the past three decades. The third way, uh, basically, we have to pay attention uh, is the geographical distribution of the physicians. So um, what if in one state um, they are more actually concentrated than the other states? So basically, we have to uh, look at the, all these um, indicators, absolute number, uh, uh, physician to population ratio, and also the geographic uh, distribution of the physicians. When we look at this graph, the absolute number of the physicians in the United States more than doubled uh, during the past uh, three decades. Um, and um, so uh, you can see we have the total number, the patient care and primary care, and uh, as a ratio, you can see uh, the middle uh, rectangular shows the patient care. About 80% of the old physicians were in direct patient care in 2009, and 20% were engaged in teaching, research, or administration. So as you can see that the primary care had a kind of um, uh, increased over the time, but not a, as a um, basically um, ratio of the total increase, and we talk about that later. Looking at the physician to uh, production ratio, um, this uh, table shows the active physicians per 100,000 population by degree type in 2009. Uh, so we have the United States, the uh, total population here is in the first column, and then we have the total active physicians. This is the number of the physicians, uh, and this is the um, ratio based on the uh, per 100,000 population. And this is the, the last column shows the ranking uh, of different states. So based on the ranking, uh, in the last column, Massachusetts has the first rank of the highest, uh, basically, rate uh, uh, ratio per 100,000 population of the physicians, and the second rank belongs to Maryland. So the, the three states with the fewest doctors are Georgia, Wyoming, and Oklahoma. And as you can see, that shows the uh, basically life expectancy also um, is at around 77 years. And when we look at the, compared to the three essays with the most doctor, we can see that Massachusetts, Maryland, and New York, they have the higher uh, life expectancies uh, around like 80 years old. The distribution of the primary care and especially care physicians in the United States, um, basically the primary care physicians include the family uh, practice, uh, general practice, internal medicine, obstetrics, uh, gyne uh, gyne gynecologists, and um, pediatrics. Um, the number of the specialty physicians in the United States over the last 3D case increase at a faster uh, pace than the number of the primary care physicians. And uh, we show that why this is important. Um, so uh, currently, uh, there are so many studies that are trying to see will United States have an adequate supply of physicians in the year 2020? And we look at the empirical studies and uh, the empirical study shows that 
there will be higher proportion of the specialists basically um, compared to the primary care. So overall, uh, the empirical sh uh, studies evidence shows that um, overall shortage of the physicians of 100, about 124,000 by, uh, by the year of 2020. Now, how they calculated that, um, we have to look at the future supply and demand. So you have to predict basically the supply and demand based on the demographics and technological changes. So the basically demographic changes, aging population, um, shift the demand to the right and technological changes shift the supply to the right to the right so based on the basically um, uh, the shift of the, each of these um, uh, curve demand and supply we can determine uh, whether we have the shortage or um, surplus in the future the study based on different uh, estimation and prediction, they found the shortage of primary care physicians and surplus of specialists. There are too many specialists and too few primary care physicians, and uh, this is a problem, especially because the specialists are more prone to uh, overutilize high technology uh, medical procedures with the uh, basic en enhanced cost technology compared to the primary care doctors. So there is a higher number of the specialists in the United States, about 60% than the other developed countries, which is between 25 to 50%. Now, so what is this, why this is important? Because there is a link between patient outcome and the primary care physicians per capita. Uh, so, it's not just the primary care per se, because the physician staffing patterns of primary care um, basically determine, which includes, uh, determine the output, which includes uh, staff care coordinators, uh, health educators, uh, behavioral health specialists, and pharmacists, and etc. Uh, basically, um, the link between uh, patient outcomes and primary care physicians per capita uh, is very significant uh, compared to the um, other specialists. So when we look at this um, percent uh, change uh, between the 1998 and 2006 in the percentage of the United States Medical School graduate filling residency positions in various specialties, you see that um, the number of the uh, medical students, uh, they are uh, going to the basically different, uh, specializing in different specialty are bigger than just the uh, family practice and internal medicine and uh, um, uh, obstetrics, uh, gynecology and pediatric and general surgery. So let's talk about the mood of practice and reimbursement practices of managed care buyers of physician services. Why do we have to talk about mood of practice and reimbursement practices uh, in the same as slides? Because they are very correlated. About almost 90% 90, 90 of the old physicians have at least one managed care contract. So with the development of managed care uh, organizations, uh, with moving away from the fee-for-service reimbursement toward basically different uh, reimbursement package, the physicians, um, they cannot uh, basically handle uh, all the paperwork and uh, hire uh, highly uh, skilled, um, basically, um, uh, workers to help them with the paperwork. So therefore, um, the trend away from smaller practices toward larger multi-doctor modes of production, uh, you can see. So do we have to be worried about the uh, economics uh, of scoop and economics of scale? Um, so when they are uh, 
basically merging together? Uh, do we have to be uh, worried about the market power? Although uh, government is a major player in the uh, physician services market, about like a 38% uh, in 2010, uh, basically the private uh, sector accounted about 62% uh, of physicians' revenue in 2010. Why? Because this is basically uh, due to the out-of-pocket that uh, most of the patients, they have to pay like about 20% or so out-of-pocket from basically either um, uh, from their uh, insurance Comp uh, basically, the uh, uh, excuse me. The patients uh, they pay from the uh, private insurance company, uh, and even the rest of that, uh, the two, twenty percent or thirty percent out of pocket is basically uh, they pay out of pocket. So uh, this is more actually serious than the hospital. In contrast, because in the hospital, the government sector accounted for seventy percent of the total revenue of the hospital services. Basically, compared to the physicians in hospital, the out-of-pocket is very small, like 3% or so. Um, so this is largely because of the out-of-pocket payments are a more important source of funds for physicians than for hospital. Now, do we have to be worried about uh, market concentration for physicians? Um, so the, the answer is not really because the cost control mechanism by managed care organization diminishes uh, the autonomy of physicians traditionally enjoyed in practicing medicine. Looking at the changes in the size and type of the medical group, you can see uh, physicians by practices settings in 1996 to 2008. And as you can see that the solo uh, to two physician practices uh, decreased from 41% uh, to 32% in 2008. And um, so you can see basically uh, the uh, more than 50 physician practices uh, increase from 2.9 percent to 6 percent in 2008. So the trends appears to be physicians uh, becoming part of the large group and working in hospitals. So let's look at the barriers to entry. Uh, the barriers to entry in uh, medical uh, uh, basically practice is basically um, related to the educational and training. Uh, sorry, there is a, a error typo here to end here. And training. So barriers to entry. There is a high opportunity opportunity cost of becoming a medical doctor, um, and um, uh, the entry into the medical uh, school is very comprehensive and selective worldwide. In the United States, is even more difficult than uh, the Europe. The average 50% uh, average of the applicants are accepted into at least one uh, school. And medical school can be um, super expensive, up to like two uh, to 300,000 basically for four years in Europe. The basically, it's very heavily subsidized. The length of the medical school varies um, in the United States and Canada. Uh, you have to basically uh, obtain your bachelor degree and then uh, enter uh, to the medical school in European um, countries. You can go directly from high school to the medical school. Now, the rate of return in medicine is significantly higher than uh, market interest rate. It's about like 11 to 14 percent. What does it mean? It means that so... All this investment you have made in the medical school is paying up, uh, paying off by higher uh, basically rate of return when you finished your medical school. Um, so it's about 11 to 14 percent, which is much higher than the market rate, average market rate. And this is actually even is higher for medical specialists like neurosurgeon and uh, immunologists. 
uh, this how we can calculate the rate of return uh, and investment in medicine we have to look at the uh, opportunity cost of the time these uh, students are in a school during the say that uh, seven years and even if they wanted to specialize uh, it's like more than uh, 10 to 15 years to become a doctor and a specialist and uh, educational cost basically uh, so the biggest opportunity cost is the time in the school that they can actually earn money by working in other uh, jobs so that's the bigger cost we call that opportunity cost and the other regular costs such as you know educational tuition and uh, etc so after they finish their uh, schools they have to basically uh, go as a resident uh, in addition to the classroom work. Residency is uh, a period of on-the-job training following medical school. So the new residents, uh, since they lack experience, and when they, uh, so when they arrive at the school, uh, empirical evidence shows that uh, medical errors goes up uh, in the United States, it's July, they call July effect. Uh, and in uh, UK, they call August killing seasons because all the medical uh, students, uh, they go to the hospital for training. And so therefore, be careful, don't get sick and don't go to hospital in July in the United States and in August in, in the UK. Now... So the point here is that because we have the shortage of the um, um, physicians, so there is a work art trade-offs. So the empirical, there is an uh, empirical question um, between uh, which effect dominates. The longer work hours uh, creates basically makes you, uh, makes the students makes, uh, to fatigue or, and uh, that may impair physicians' cognitive abilities and in turn may affect patients' health. So there, are, there may be a lot of medical error when the physicians are feeling tired, right? On the other hand, the shorter work uh, hours requires that more hands off by physicians and thus greater chance for error. So if they don't practice enough, they don't learn. So there is a trade-offs and um, so, um, basically depends on, uh, of course, um, the uh, uh, number of the hours they work and the, uh, the places the study ha um, indicate different results. Now, so far we only talked about the physicians, but healthcare workforce, uh, besides the physicians, we also uh, uh, to have to talk about the other workforce. The United States Department of the Labor recognizes over 400 different jobs title in the healthcare uh, health sector. Uh, the healthcare sector includes 6.5 percent of the United States labor force, about like 14 million jobs in the in 2008. So 10 of the 20 fastest growing occupations are healthcare related. And uh, so uh, the workforce consists of physicians, nurses, physicians, assistant, nurse uh, practitioners, dentists, pharmacists, lab uh, technicians, etc. So therefore, we have to also consider, uh, besides the physician, we have to also consider the nurses and physicians, assistants, and etc. Uh, workforce um, in the uh, outcomes as well. Healthcare will generate 3.2 million new wage and salary jobs between 2008 and 2018, um, more than any other industry, largely in response to rapid growth in elderly population. Of course, this was before the uh, Affordable Care Act estimates. So therefore, uh, so paying attention to the healthcare uh, workforce is very important um, let's start with the registered nurse and physician's assistants. Physicians extender, uh, extenders um, are healthcare professionals licensed to practice medicines 
uh, with physicians uh, supervisions. So it's about like a 70, uh, 75,000 license. Uh, in, it was in 2008. 45% uh, of these PAs practice primary care. Um, and then uh, these PAs able to diagnose, manage, treat uh, common illnesses, provide uh, preventive uh, services and respond to common emergencies. Um, I have to include that uh, there are so many foreign physicians that they come to the United States and they basically cannot pass their uh, uh, ISFMG and they actually take this uh, PA um, uh, training and they become PAs. Some of them, they may actually, they, they have been a surgeon in their countries, but in here, they actually work as a PAs. So they are very actually uh, professionally uh, uh, very expert in their jobs. So the median, the median salary of other healthcare uh, providers uh, in 2010 um, for physicians assistant was about like 86,000, over 86,000, and for registered nurses was, um, you know, about 65,000. Now, the registered nurses uh, constitute the nation's single largest healthcare uh, professions, about uh, 3 million uh, registered nurses in 2010. Um, and, uh, and then the licensed practical uh, nurses or licensed uh, vocational nurses also uh, these are kind of barrier to the market for uh, healthcare uh, force uh, that we have to consider. Now, the reason for uh, mentioning about the other uh, workforce in healthcare is the staff model um, uh, health uh, managed care organization and physicians licensing um, obsolete. So uh, using a staff model uh, HMO, uh, if there is an increase in the wage of, um, wages of physicians, the HMO likely to decrease the number of the physicians and increase the number of the physicians extenders uh, utilized to respond to the uh, current level of medical care. So what happened? What is the effect of this um, staff model HMO? Um, the many institutional and structural changes that might make physicians' licenses uh, obsolete because increased composition in the physician services market, rapid growth of more for uh, profit, uh, medical care providers, increased use of brand names and growth of uh, employed rather than self-employed physicians all uh, decrease the need for licensors of physicians. So basically, um, these uh, staff model HMO uh, decrease this uh, barrier uh, uh, to enter to the uh, uh, physician's uh, industry by decreasing the basically uh, the licensing, uh, physicians are licensing in this industry. To reduce the shortage of the physician services, uh, we, have a few, uh, we have basically two uh, solutions. Uh, we have to either decrease the demand or increase the supply. So decrease the demand for physician services um, basically by providing financial incentives to patients to use uh, fewer, less valued services, and to physicians to better manage the care of chronically ill patients. So this decreased demand by physicians, so you have to increase the co-payment for, uh, uh, for the uh, physicians. Uh, you know, fee-for-service is the worst, uh, actually, uh, payment. Uh, so we have to change that uh, to the way to increase the incentives of the physicians uh, to uh, basically uh, decrease the uh, demand for uh, services rather than uh, asking the patient to have different uh, visits without increasing the quality of care. The second uh, way is increasing the supply of physician services 
by boosting physicians' productivity. So this productivity could be using uh, more physician extenders, so give them some physician's help, um, physician's assistance, and, you know, and using more technology, medical technology, that improves physician's efficiency. Now, the physician extenders, uh, such as physician's assistant and nurse practitioners, have some medical training. Uh, so the HMO may actually substitute these uh, physician's extenders for physicians in the production of certain medical services. So the need for, so that's what happened by, uh, this may actually uh, decrease the need for licensors of physicians is decreasing. Uh, in summary, basically, as the market for physician services uh, becomes more competitive, market forces can be re uh, relied on more heavily to dispose of uh, incompetent or unprofessional doctors.